it is good to hear the buzz of conversation, and I'm glad you're enjoying yourselves as we get ready to begin this evening. The Believer's Church Lectureship uh, has friends that help us with this work, and we're grateful for Butler Church offering this place. Uh, the uh, Bible and Religious Studies uh, Division is uh, supportive and encouraging, and I'm thankful for the senior professionals and a number of them who are in attendance as well. So uh, thank you for that support. Um, this evening, we get to hear the second lectureship, the second lecture in the series comes to us, of course, from Dr. Drew Hart, who is a professor at Messiah University. Before that, he pastored for 10 years. Uh, Dr. Hart's dissertation considered how Christian discipleship was formed by, uh, it can be formed by black theologies and Anabaptist theology, and how together those forces work to untangle the forces of supremacy in Western Christendom. On his website, Dr. Hart describes radical discipleship to Jesus. It refuses to distort and domesticate Jesus' life teachings, death and resurrection, and accepts the call to deny oneself, follow Jesus, and accept the consequences that come from such faithfulness. A Christian public witness, he says, rejects the temptation to privatize faith to only matters of the heart. We're called to embody and make visible God's reign on earth, to speak truth to power. And he reminds us that Christian solidarity must be Jesus-shaped. We identify and stand with those that Jesus did in his day. We link arms with the impoverished, vulnerable, oppressed, and marginalized. How we receive the least of these is how we receive Christ. I'd like to invite you to bow with me in prayer as we be prepare to hear from Dr. Hart. Loving God, in Jesus you destroyed death and gave us life. In trust we pray, God, in your justice, hear our prayer. Help us to recognize and love Christ in our neighbor. God, in your justice, hear our prayer. Advance efforts to ensure that all people have adequate health care and provisions for child care. God, in your justice, hear our prayer. Inspire efforts to address structural racism and racial tension. God, in your justice, hear our prayer. May God show us mercy and give us the mind of Jesus so that we may walk in newness of life by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dr. Drew Hart. Today and actually turned on my mic here. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, join you all again. Um, and for those that were here for the earlier talk, and in many ways this will kind of build off of right um, where we just were and kind of uh, um, continue the conversation a little bit further. Uh, so my talk today is "Who Will Be a Witness," which is the title and name for my uh, uh, latest book. Um, but what I want us to do first is to, let's see if this will work, there we go, is to tell you a story. Um, when I first moved back to, so I'm a Pennsylvania boy, all right, like Philly, then uh, went to Messiah, which is central Pennsylvania, then went back to Philly for like eight years. And then for the last, like, five years, I'm in Harrisburg again in central Pennsylvania, right? So just kind of ping-ponging back in Pennsylvania, back and forth. And so when I moved back to Harrisburg for the second time, um, 
I, you know, the first time I was kind of like a fresh out of college kid. And this time, you know, I was already an author, I was traveling and speaking and stuff. And so um, there was both familiarity with me in, in Harrisburg, but also like, oh, Drew, the speaker is coming back, right? And so I was getting all invitations and people were excited um, in, in the city of Harrisburg that I was coming back. And there was one particular church um, that invited me to come and to speak um, and they uh, did like a whole like January series, right, around my first book, Trouble I've Seen. And so they invited like different speakers for the first few weeks to come and do different talks around like race and racism. And then the final week, um, I was like the culminating uh, Sunday and, and they had folks reading like book studies on Trouble I've Seen and all that kind of stuff. And so I got in, I did um, a Sunday school with them, and it was really great. Then came and I preached and, and, that, and was received really well. And one of the things I suggested, which I mentioned earlier, was that I encouraged them to consider um, the civil rights bus tour that I had gone on, that I had gone on to others. Um, this was a, uh, you know, well-to-do, very educated uh, kind of Brethren in Christ congregation. And, and so in response, many of them, they decided as a church that they wanted to actually sponsor going on this civil rights bus tour and to send some of their members to go along with one of the sister churches uh, from the city. And so they did. And so a year after, right, they go on this trip. A year later, they asked my friend Todd, who actually leads the trip, um, to come and speak the same, like, month, right, a, a one year later. Um, and so he comes to speak. And you can imagine, like, they're kind of celebrating the moment. They're showing, like, pictures of, like, the trip. And they've got the sentimental music going and the collage stuff. You know how we do in church, right? You can picture it, right? It's all moving and stuff. And, and then it all wraps up, and he's getting ready to preach. He's, like, mentally getting ready, kind of getting the right headspace for it. Um, and before he's up to, to speak, um, Somebody in the audience yells out, why can't we just get over it? Why can't we just get over it? I'm sure he was probably not, you know, flustered a little bit. Can't imagine, like, you know, that's what's kind of in the atmosphere right before you're about to speak, right? The senior pastor, he got up and said something. He tried to, you know, but, you know, what do you do? It's already out there. It's just in the, it's in the space, you know, and he nonetheless got up and he did preach and I think um, it was received really well overall. But, you know, I was thinking when I heard that story, um, part of me wants to know, like, you know, what would I have done had somebody said, you know, why can't we just get over it, right? I, so I'm not sure if I have a holy mind or just a troubled mind, but, you know, my mind goes places. And so I'm trying to, like, replay in my mind. And, and, and I imagine that, you know, that I would want to lean into this moment because it could be a really powerful teaching moment, right? Plus, you never want to just assume anything about why someone says things, right? And so, you, so maybe this could be an opportunity to ask some questions and to go deeper and to kind of see where someone is coming from. So I might want to uh, ask the gentleman, right, um, you know, who's, because clearly he believes that it's time to get over it, I would want to know, like, what out of his own lived experience would got him to this place where he felt like it was time for us to get over it, right? So to ask him a series of questions, maybe like, you know, um, maybe in your own personal life, you know, have you been like so dedicated in your life, decades and decades of faithfulness where you've just been working hard and so now you feel like the job is done, right, and now it's time to get over it, right? Maybe that was the case for him. He just felt like he had worked so hard at it and now at the end of his life it was time to get over it. I'd maybe even want to ask him about like, you know, his uh, family line, right, because maybe he comes from a long line of folks who've just been so dedicated. Maybe like his great, great, great grandfather was an abolitionist against slavery. And maybe, you know, his dad maybe was a friend with Dr. King and collaborated and was just, you know, maybe he's got this long, beautiful line of faithfulness at every stage throughout the nation. Just, you know, everyone showing up faithfully, um, bearing witness to who Jesus Christ is in the midst of a racialized society, right? I don't want to assume anything about him. And so I would ask him, maybe even about his community and his congregation, like maybe everybody around him 
was just, had just been living lives that had refused to conform to the patterns of racism and racial injustice all around him. And so, you know, again, he just felt like the work had been done. Everybody had worked hard at it. They were committed to it. And now there's nothing else to do. Now, of course, I've never met anybody that fits that description, right? <laughs> never, ever in my life. In fact, what's fascinating is the people who I've seen uh, who sought to embody faithfully God's good news to our, our racialized world are usually the folks who say, yeah, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. I mean, that was Dr. King at the end of his life, right? And so if that's the case, that, that most likely, most of us, the, the real reality isn't um, that we should be asking how do we get over it? Because most of us have been doing nothing or very little. And or we come from lines that have not been necessarily faithful as it relates to this. And we come from even faith communities that have not borne faith, beard, faithful witness to the racial realities that, that exist in our society. And so the real question for us probably is not how do we get over it? How do we get on it for the first time? How do we get on it in the midst of mass incarceration? How do we get on it in the, in the midst of, uh, you know, uh, our undocumented brothers and sisters, right? How do we get on it because of all these crises that are happening, the double pandemic of racial injustice and uh, health disparities and all these things that are uh, shaping and impacting our lives? And so that's some of my invitation for us to kind of posture ourselves today in terms of this idea of who will be a witness. Um, it's an invitation, right? Uh, for us to be a witness, to bear witness um, uh, through our, uh, a life that uh, yields and follows Jesus and makes visible the Jesus story for our neighbors. So uh, to begin, I want us to, to spend some time thinking about a biblical figure we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. I'm not sure why. I don't know why there's not more Bible studies on Barabbas. I'm just not quite sure, but, but I'm going to take us there for a little bit. Let's think about Barabbas for, together, right? Um, so Barabbas is an interesting figure. I mean, he shows up um, in all the, um, every single one of the gospel accounts, there is Barabbas, right? I mean, we don't even get birth sometimes, but we get Barabbas every single time, right? Um, and so Barabbas is there, um, gospel stories, um, and he's also, in many ways, has been uh, a figure in popular imagination and movies and such. And it's fascinating. When, when I first uh, started looking up Barabbas images, it's really fascinating. Like, I mean, there's a lot of range of stuff that you'll find, but there's quite a few of them that, like, kind of uh, depict Barabbas as, like, kind of pulling at them crazed, right? And, like, you get the sense that he's, like, this serial killer that's just, like, lost his mind and just wants to go slaughter people for no reason in the neighborhoods, right? Or something like that. Um, there's one clip where I, is like, laughing uncontrollably, right? Like, he's mentally off or something. <laughs> he's just going crazy. And so you're like, what in the world is going on? Why is Barabbas being depicted in this way, right? Um, um, how has that become the primary way that we've depicted and described this biblical figure named Barabbas. And so I want us um, to think a little bit about who Barabbas is. And I suggest that Barabbas needs some liberating from our depictions. And as we liberate our depictions from Barabbas and understand the liberating concerns of Barabbas, I think it also helps us see something about Jesus as well that maybe sometimes we don't want to acknowledge and want to ignore. So one of the things that's helpful to remember when we're uh, reading, especially the gospel narratives, the synoptics in particular, is to remember the historical, social and historical and political context um, that these things are being written in, right? And, and to understand that, you know, the first century, um, you could say like revolution was in the air, right? Um, in fact, way before Jesus was even born, I mean, going all the way back to like the Maccabees, right? There's this revolutionary kind of spirit that has shaped first century Judaism by the time Jesus shows up and by the time Barabbas shows up. Um, and there are multiple revolts and groups, uh, sects that are engaging in revolutionary activity before Jesus, uh, during 
Jesus' time, all the way leading up to 70 AD in the Roman Jewish War, right? There's this uh, significant kind of revolutionary response to once again finding themselves under Roman occupation, right? And so uh, I just want that as the backdrop because so much, we miss so much of, especially the Synoptic Gospels, if we don't keep that revolutionary kind of context and concern in the backdrop. Because in many ways, so, some of the gospel writers are engaging some of these uh, groups and thinking um, in their texts as well. And so revolution w- was in the air, and that's the backdrop that we need to remember when we're thinking about Barabbas in particular. Uh, but also it says something about Jesus as well, as we will see. So just real quick. You know, if we were to look at all the different way, places where Barabbas is mentioned, um, I'll mention a few of these, right? So Mark 15, 7, um, it says this, A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising, right? That's, that's what uh, Mark says about who Barabbas was. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising, right? He was an insurrectionist. He committed murder in the uprising. Luke 23, 19 says, Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder, right? So Barabbas was participating in an insurrection, right? Uh, and Luke actually mentions him again in verse 25, 20, chapter 23. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will, all right? Even Gospel of John, you might think, oh, Gospel of John, he'll kind of ignore this. No, he describes that as well, right? 1840, it says, they shouted back, no, not him, give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part in an uprising, right? Um, so by this point already, pretty coming pretty clear, the, the Bible's not really, like, vague on who Barabbas was, his participation, why he did what he did. Um, it was because, in many ways, what we would call a freedom fighter. He was an insurrectionist. He was trying to overthrow the Roman powers that existed at that time. And then what's interesting in the Gospel of Matthew is Matthew actually does something a little bit distinct that we don't find in the other Gospel um, accounts. I'll read here, Matthew 27, 16 through 17. And there's a longer extended, I would encourage you to go afterwards, go read um, the larger section of Matthew 27. But it says this, at that time, they had a notorious prisoner. So at this point, Matthew just refers to him as notorious. Everyone's supposed to know who he has a reputation, right? Who exactly he is. And it says, called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Now what's fascinating is if you read multiple translations, some of them will say Jesus Barabbas, Some will just say Barabbas. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here, right? Um, And so I had to do a little digging, a little homework, um, and it quickly found that um, it's believed that the oldest transcript said Jesus Barabbas, and then some were a little uncomfortable with Jesus Barabbas being his name, so they, out of respect for Jesus the Christ, they take that out. And then later when we have the older manuscripts, many translations have begun to put it in. So you'll find it in, so like, some translations, I think like Common English Bible, I think the new NIV will have it. The, I think NRSV has it. And, and it. But there's certain ones that don't have it, right? And so it's interesting um, there. But I think actually it's, we miss, and maybe they misunderstood the significance of why. I think Matthew intentionally wants to say Jesus and Jesus. This is not an, an accident. Um, he wants to make a point here, right? I mean, think about just the names. Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua, right? The one who saves, right? Your liberator, so to speak. Um, Barabbas, son of the father, right? And then Jesus, the one who saves, right? Your liberator, the Christ, the anointed one, the king, the one whose expectations are upon who are supposed to deliver them from their oppressors, right? Which one do you want? Who, which liberator do you want? Who do you trust in? Right? You have a really powerful moment here in which Matthew's actually inviting you to make a choice in terms of the kind, the very means by which that liberation will come. Right? Um, and, and, it, and so I think there's uh, really something helpful here in paying attention to Barabbas precisely because 
Barabbas shows up at the very end, at the pinnacle points of the Jesus story, every single time. The crowd is making a choice, and in many ways here, Matthew's saying, and you've got to make a choice too, right? By what, what are the means by which you are going to seek your liberation? I want to suggest that we've denigrated Barabbas, number one, making him into this crazed serial killer, randomly killing people for no purpose and no point, and that we ought to think a little more Nat Turner than the Joker when we're thinking about Barabbas, right? That here's a desperate Jew who believes that God is going to act and deliver them from Roman occupation, and believes that in the tradition of the Maccabees, they've got to participate in this work and make it happen. And that's in contrast to uh, who Jesus is being portrayed as. Thank you. And so, in many ways, uh, you know, when we begin to liberate Barabbas, so to speak, it helps us begin to see Jesus' radical, revolutionary, nonviolent way even more, right? Because the mistake has been, is, is in the West, right, as Gentiles sometimes reading these texts will say something like, oh, well, you know, the Jews got it all wrong, right? Jesus came he didn't come to bring them out of Roman occupation. He came to bring a spiritual kingdom and afterlife, right? And so it's kind of like the social versus the spiritual, which I think is a really bad reading of the gospel story, right? Because Jesus clearly cares about people's social conditions. I mean, Luke 4, 18 and 19, right? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor and release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, right? He cared about the social conditions. And then that's exactly what we see throughout the Gospel of Luke, right? It's him meeting the needs of the people, speaking truth to power, and ultimately, which we'll get into in our morning session tomorrow, clashing with the establishment, right? Um, and so it's not quite, uh, it doesn't make any sense when Jesus is, preaching that this kingdom has come and it is here on earth for us to think that it's just some spiritual thing and that they've got it all wrong. I think uh, what we see when we see Barabbas in the story is actually helping us to think, on one hand, yes, it is, it's a much more expanded implications for deliverance, for God's liberation, but it's also wrestling with the means by which we go about it. And we miss that if we just make one about the social versus the spiritual, um, when Jesus cares about all of that. Um, and it's by what means, what will it look like, right? What kind of life do we have to live on the ground in the concrete in terms of this uh, liberative work? Um, and in this case, we see Jesus as this nonviolent, I go ahead and say revolutionary Messiah in response to this uh, violent revolution that Barabbas is willing to engage in. We'll come back to at least the implications of what that means for us a little bit later. Let's go to the next slide. So um, I, I want us to do a little church history, right? We'll do like the, the shorthand version, right? Spark Notes version of church history. Um, hopefully, you know, uh, uh, when we think about um, church history, you know, the the over summer, we can overstate things a little bit, but for the sake, we'll, we'll be a little crude, right, in our oversimplifications of it. But you have the early church, the first few centuries of the church, they're on the margins of society, right, in power. Um, and they can't imagine being in power in society, right? Um, and then, you know, everyone pays attention to Constantine, and Constantine comes um, in the beginning of the fourth century, and he ends Christian persecution and, and invests money into basilicas and buildings. And uh, before you know it, like the, the bishops and the Senate have like swapped places in terms of who has access to the emperor and who's in power. And you see the church kind of moving from the margins to the center, right? 
And then before you know it, I mean, a hundred years after that, you have Theodosius is making Christianity the official religion of the land. And you see this really kind of transforming situation overall for the life of the church, right? And if that continues, in some ways, I mean, we put maybe too much emphasis on Constantine as a single figure. Um, certainly he played a role, but there's so much more to it. But nonetheless, you see this rise of what people call Christendom, right? Um, and you see this history in which I call it uh, uh, the Christian supremacy over society, right? A top-down Christian supremacy over society is being enforced, right? Um, and so this thing is growing, and by 1000 AD, you know, you've got this really big, wielding uh, uh, Christian civilization, so to speak, that emerges. And you have the, con you have, um, the Crusades, all those things, and, and, and there's a way in which, at this point, Christianity is looking out and identifies itself as Christian, right? And the rest of the world is heathen. Right? That's kind of the paradigm that many are operating out of. You go a few more centuries, in 1441, Portugal begins to enslave Africans, right? For the first time in 1441. Um, and we have writing, I mean, it was done with distinctly Christian, uh, Christian imagination, so to speak. You could say, if we use Jennings' term, a diseased Christian imagination. But nonetheless, um, clearly seeing themselves thinking theologically about their encounter, their conquest, enslavement of African people in this historical moment. And then in 1455, you have a, a, a papal bull, Romanus Pontifex, right? And basically, this papal bull, this church teaching, formal church teaching, basically does the, the theological heavy lifting for what already began, which is we go give you permission to enslave, to reduce to, to property and, and slavery and to conquer and plunder um, on, on behalf of Christianity, right? Like literally in the most stark terms, um, in no kind of vague way, they're given the blessing to engage in colonial conquest. Um, Spain follows in, um, and of course, we all know in 1492, lots of people pick the story at 1492, um, but by the time Christopher Columbus shows up, and he, the new thing he's doing is he's taking it to the Americas, but, but the idea of conquest has already been blessed by the church, um, and so there's something in the making, and so you have this Western Christian colonial conquest that explodes throughout the globe and, and impacts um, you know, almost every part of the globe in some way or form, right? Um, certainly all of Africa is impacted deeply by it. The Americas, um, their worlds are turned upside down, and um, much of Asia also experiences aspects from colonialism as well. And so I, I guess when I, when I share some of this history, I guess what's important for us to think about you know, because sometimes in the church, we're not actually honest about how white supremacy uh, evolved um, in our history. And so we'll say things like, you know, we've been too complicit with racism. Well, that doesn't seem to really capture what took place. The church wasn't just complicit in racism. It literally birthed white supremacy into the world. White supremacy as we know it is just as much a theological problem as it is a, 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 a sociological one. As, as Christianity and Western society conflicted one another and then went out into the world, white supremacy was the aftermath of that, right? In the midst of engaging in conquest, that was the justifications. And what happens in the midst of that is that Jesus is literally, is not outside of what's happening. Jesus is literally uh, being used, right, as a mascot for social domination, as a mascot for the status quo, as a, as a mascot for conquest. Literally whitened, right? And it's impacted all areas of life. Theology, discipleship, mission, ecclesiology, communal worship, the stories we tell, our economic practices, 
our politics, how we organize society. Deeply, deeply implicated, impacted, shaped by this legacy of colonialism. So I, I do think it's helpful, in, or maybe I should say truthful, for us to, as the church, talk about Western Christianity birthing white supremacy into the world. And that maybe changes a little bit our own sense of responsibility for some of the issues that are going on as white supremacy in many ways uh, took on a life of its own. So it doesn't, it's not uh, stuck only to the church, right? Though there's some very damning uh, research that relates to Christians and white Christians in particular and racial views we have to reckon with. But aside from that, white supremacy has taken on a life of its own. But we have to take some responsibility for the way that it was birthed as a diseased theological imagination. Next, please. In the midst of um, this history, it's important also to kind of just situate what it means to be a Gentile, right? Um, it's fascinating that, you know, I mean, so many of my students, when I tell them that Christianity in the West, that they were a minority for many centuries. They're like, what, really? In the West, a minority? I was like, you do realize that Christianity um, is not indigenous to the West, right? Like, it's, it was in the East, right? In fact, you think about the great theologians, they're not Western, they, they were African, in Asia Minor, you know, Tertullian, and Origen, and Augustine, and Athanasius, right? I mean, many of them African theologians. Um, and, and we can't seem to fathom um, that, that Christianity is not indigenous to the West. But what happened, again, because of this conflating of, of after, after a while, right, as Christianity in the West eventually does grow and becomes the larger uh, global population, um, then eventually what begins to happen is, is there's this forgetting, right, this forgetting uh, that Christianity was not indigenous to the, to the West. And, and eventually it's almost like a claiming a copyright on Jesus and a copyright on Christianity and a copyright on, on the Bible, right? Anybody, if you want to become Christian, you come through us on our terms in the way that we practice it and understand it and interpret it, right? And this, so this possession of, of Christianity and Jesus. Um, and, and so... Uh, Jennings, Willie Jennings calls it uh, uh, Gentile forgetfulness, right? Uh, forgetting of one's Gentile identity. That we were engrafted into somebody else's story. That we were once, Ephesians 2, right? Off, <laughs> but by the grace of God have been brought into the household of God. But this claiming of co a copyright on Jesus and Christianity has also played a tool for justifying colonialism and for uh, supremacy and oppression over other peoples as well. Uh, even to the point where Jesus was, um, you read like Immanuel Kant and stuff, some of them, almost like Jesus is the best of the best, right? He's like the, 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 the achievement uh, he reflects the very best of what the West is, right? It kind of severs Jesus from his Jewishness, severs him from his own historical context and claims him as our own, right? Um, all these things have facilitated um, much harm. Next, please. In... Uh, one of the things that were most... Uh, challenging for me when I was kind of learning about some of this history was thinking about like you know how do how do we think about Jesus in the midst of this and how did even my ancestors experience the very name Jesus you know there's a, a guy by the name of Sir John Hawkins he was the the very first person to take enslaved people across the, slave, the uh, uh, transatlantic journey, right? The Middle Passage. So there was already slavery going on, but, but he was the first person to actually take them across this two-month, two at least, you know, voyage. 
He got the blessing of Queen Elizabeth to do so, and so he began kidnapping West Africans, and he was selling them for really great profits in the Americas. But did you know that the, the name of the slave ship was Jesus of Lubeck? And the nickname for the slave, for the slave ship was the, the good ship Jesus. And of course, there would be other slave ships with all kinds of different Christian names slapped onto it, right? There's a whole variety. And we could go on and on about all the different names of slave ships. But the very first slave ship to make that transatlantic journey, Jesus. In many ways, there was so much vandalizing of the name of Jesus throughout this history. Distorting, diseasing, mangling, entangling Jesus in a project, a death-dealing project. Next, please. I'm from Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, as I mentioned. 20, 30 minutes from where I live, there's something called the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. I know in Canada there's been a lot of news. We haven't had our reckoning yet in the U.S. because we practiced it and there's going to be a reckoning is coming. Carlisle Indian School is, is one of the more famous of boarding schools in the United States. Um, and there was a man by the name of Richard Pratt who was famous for saying, kill the Indian, save the man. Kill the Indian, save the man. All things die, all things become new. We were told missionaries were going all around the world to proclaim Jesus to share Jesus with others, right? But whose image were they being fashioned after? Jesus's or Western man? You think about the massive, uh, you know, you, you can use the word turning the world upside down in positive ways or negative ways but the turning of people's worlds upside down, destroying people's practices and customs and ways of life through a Christian imagination. Claiming we're going to make you more like Jesus, you just have to anglicize your name, cut your hair, reject all your customs of, from your community, and become more like Here in the U.S., um, white supremacy literally thrived in and through white churches. And it's, it's, you know, it's really easy to want to believe that, you know, you know, when we see like images of the KKK, it's like, oh, that's some fringe. That has nothing to do with Christianity. That was mainstream in the early 20th century. They were having marches with thousands and thousands of people in the public square. In fact, Woodrow Wilson showed in the White House the famous Birth of a Nation, you know, KKK propaganda film and called it a masterpiece, right? It was the E.T. or Jurassic Park or Star Wars or whatever you want to call it of its time, right? The groundbreaking cinematography. Um, but, but it was deeply at that time deeply entangled with Christian thoughts and practice. Yes, diseased, but yes, nonetheless, a Christian thought and practice that had deeply been the very foundation and grounding of this nation. Jesus was being taught, preached, prayed to in ways that 
seem to be completely compatible with KKKs and white citizens councils, Jim Crow laws, the lynching of 5,000 black men, women, and children. Jesus was an a, a icon, right? A, a mascot for all of that. If you remember the, in fact, let me go back. Can we go back, I'm sorry, uh, to slide, the one that says birthing white supremacy. Let me go all the way back to here. I'm sorry, there we go. So I want you to look at that image for a moment. Look at that image. I'm pretty confident when I look, I'm pretty confident that the person that made that image, it's called Hope for the World, right? That, that they had good intentions, I think. I think, I'm pretty sure they had good intentions. When, I think that they had the idea of the song, right? The Sunday school song, you know, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight, you know, that song. I think that that was like the driving backdrop behind um, creating this image. And yet, it's steeped, right, in colonial white supremacist ideology. First, I mean, we notice whitens Jesus, number one, right? And everyone's gazing at this white Jesus. Um, we, we can get into all conversations around optics and aesthetics and desire and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole other conversation. But we have all these, so all the peoples of the world gazing at this white, whitened Jesus. Um, and then you see this black child in particular, right? Black child, only one on the ground, naked, back turned, only one, you can't even see his face, right? And so what we have here is even in this supposedly global vision for Jesus in the world, deeply steeped in paternalism and hierarchies, right? Um, and how much of Christian imagination and mission, right? In fact, can we even say the word missions and not be implicated in so much of this? Jesus has too often been a mascot for the status quo rather than uh, God's reign breaking in and subverting it. Let's jump forward um, all the way to Frederick Duck. Yeah, there we go. So all of that, all right, a lot of, a lot of um, negative examples. But of course, that's not the only Christianity that existed in these lands, right? Um, in fact, there's a, a prophetic black tradition that was through every single stage bearing witness and speaking back, talking back, and saying that ain't a good reflection of who God is and who Jesus Christ is. Uh, I'll share, this is what Douglas said in 1845. This is from his appendix of his slave narrative. Um, he says this, What I have said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of, of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, woman-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land, right? And he's not the only one. There's kind of similar comments you get from like Sojourner Truth, others, all the way up through, I mean, we could go um, decade by decade and, and see the faithfulness of talking back, right, to these diseased distortions of Jesus Christ and people seeking to actually live out and share God's love and God's justice um, in the real world um, precisely because of who Jesus was. Um, as a counter witness, literally, to the disease distortions and status quo manifestations of Christianity in so much of society. Um, it's important to name, right, that other, other streams that existed on the underside of what was going on so often mainstream. Uh, next, please. Um, and so what I want us to do now is think a little bit about... Um, uh, new practices, new ways of being in the world, right? As the church 
um, both collectively internally as the church, and then finally externally in terms of how we go out into the world, right? Next, please. So um, I'm, I'm married. I have three boys, all right? Um, three boys, 10, 8, and 4, right? Um, growing size, and you know, obviously when you have that three-year-old, he came a little later, and we had to make some adjustments, right? And one of the things that's interesting is uh, my wife, um, Renee, she will sometimes, you know, ask me, you know, um, about making some changes to the house because, you know, we're a growing family and sometimes, you know, you feel a little cramped, right? And so at times in the past she would say things like, you know, <coughs> well, let me, get, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, if, if I were to have you over my house, I would usually say, make yourself at home. Right? That's usually the first. Make yourself at home, get comfortable. And when I say get comfortable, I usually say, I, like, I, I don't want people in my house, like, all uptight, right, and stiff in my house. Like, I want people to be comfortable, to be, you know, at ease, kick your feet up, go, feel free to go and get a drink, whatever, right? Just get comfortable in my house. Um, but when I say make yourself at home, I don't really mean make yourself at home, right? <laughs> Like, there's some things I didn't really mean by that. So I don't mean, like, come into my house and start, like, rearranging my furniture. I don't mean, like, take down my family pictures and put yours up, right? And I certainly don't mean, like, go up into the bedroom and put on, like, my robe or something, coming down, right, all coming up. So I don't really mean make yourself at home, right? God's still working on me on this hospitality piece, right? The line between host and guest, right? I'm getting there, but I'm not quite there. And so, so there's limits, right, in terms of what I actually mean. Um, but of course, like, you know, my wife, like, she has full belonging in her house. So, you know, it's not strange necessarily for things to be moved around in our house. I get back, and I'm like, oh, that's different, right? No, all right, that's fine, you know. <coughs> or new pictures up, right? Things are updated, and you know, that's nice. Um, I don't like her wearing my favorite hoodie, but I can't seem to stop her from doing it anyway, so she's claimed full belonging there as well, and, and so, you know, there's things that when you fully belong, right, there's certain things that you practice and you do, but, but of course, full belonging goes much deeper than just those things. Like I said, we're a growing family, and sometimes, you know, uh, the bathroom is already occupied, and someone else has got to go, and there's five people, right, sometimes there's a line, and so she's imagined, like, Maybe we can, like, you know, put another bathroom in. Like, maybe it can fit right underneath the stairwell or something, you know, and she's trying to imagine. And sometimes she'll say, like, maybe we can knock this whole wall out and have, like, a little more open space for, the, for people to move around and stuff like that. And, and, and what she's talking about when she says these kind of things is <coughs> she's not just talking about, like, little decorative changes. She's talking about actual structural changes to the building itself. Um, structural changes so that everybody in our household can flourish, Right? And I think that one of the things that we've got to be able to think about as the church, you know, um, it's hard enough for us to, I mean, every church says they welcome people. And there's not a church that doesn't say that they're not welcoming, right? Well, we welcome people. Um, but usually people are welcomed as guests, right? Um, and, and not invited to have full belonging. Nonetheless, still leaving up white Jesuses everywhere and kind of organizing our lives in such ways um, to let people know who really belongs and who doesn't. And so there's some changes, even superficial changes, right, um, that can be made. But if we really want to actually express and articulate and seek after full belonging all, for all of us, then we've got to also include deep structural changes to how we organize our lives together so that we are willing to do whatever it takes so that whoever's a part of our family uh, full belonging in Christ, that we will change as necessary policies and practices and how we run our organization so that everyone can flourish and have full belonging in the household of God, right? And I think that that is an imagination that we still have failed to see. We're still at the, we welcome people in um, and have not moved to full belonging in Jesus Christ, even in the life of the church. And this deeply is seen as it relates to how race has plagued the life of the church in the West. Uh, next, please. Um, imagine if we were in a room 
we gather once like once a week, right? But this room has like a big table and we all sit around the table <coughs> and and every time that we meet around this table, I get up and stand on the table in the center of it while everybody else sits around the side of the table, right? And week after week, that's just how we practice. That's how we gather together. We, uh, you know, everyone sits around. I stand up on the table, get into the center, and then we have our conversations like that. And now imagine, you know, after, you know, weeks of doing this, somebody yells out, hey, Drew, why don't you sit, you know, around the table like everybody else? Why do you got to stand at the center of the table every single week, right? Like, why can't you sit like everybody else around the table? Oh, man, I I don't like this. I don't like being pointed out. I don't like the attention. I feel like I'm being picked on. I don't like this at all. Why am I being marginalized? Now, of course, hopefully somebody there, after I have my little attitude, is going to, say, Drew, you're not being marginalized, you're being decentralized, and there's a difference, right? And and it's not, I'm not feeling something, something is happening here, so I'm experiencing something, right? And it's uncomfortable, and this discomfort that I'm experiencing, nobody likes that, but what I'm actually being invited to is something that actually invites me into deeper humanity with others, shared humanity with others, rather than this disease distorted hierarchical way in which I was engaging in relating to others, right? And I think in our society today, let's, let's be honest, like our society's going through changes right now. There are shifts happening. There are conversations that are, uh, haven't ha- been had for centuries that need to be had on a larger scale, right? In terms of who has access to what and power and all that kind of stuff that's going on in our society. And many, and I'll be explicit here, many white men in particular, white people in general, but white men in particular, are very uncomfortable in the moment as people are are naming white supremacy and patriarchy and the ways that we have interacted and lived with one another in ways that are unhealthy, right? And so there are shifts happening, and sometimes I hear people say, why am I being marginalized? And what we're actually missing is this invitation to a beloved community, right? To a deeper, fuller way of life that we're invited into in God's reign. Um, and I think that, that we've got to have a vision for shalom, so to speak, right? Uh, of the interdependent flourishing of all people. And that will require that um, some uh, mountains need to come down and some valleys need to be lifted up. And it's gonna mean some shifts and changes for folks Um, But that is not the same as marginalization. Um, This is actually a restoration, a liberation for all people. Um, And it's healthy and it's good for all people. And we've got to be able to tell a more truthful story, especially in the life of the church, right? Because sometimes we allow uh, distorted narratives of what's happening to remain in the life of the church, even as, let's say in that particular case, white men still overrepresent most things, right? Um, but yes, there are shifts happening. It's not comfortable. Um, and we can uh, acknowledge people's discomfort and also continue to move towards beloved community as the, as the church as well. Uh, next, please. So again, I, I said internally, but also then externally as well. I want us to think about igniting the church for the, to participate in God's uh, justice. Uh, next, please. So we often hear it say, give a man a fish, right? And he can eat for a day. Teach a man a fish, right? And they can eat for a lifetime. But we don't ask, what happens if somebody doesn't have access to the pond? What if it's blocked off, right? Then what do you do? See, the sometimes overly simplistic answers to really complex problems that ignore the systemic, structural, institutional policies and practices in place that devastate people's lives. And sometimes we need more than just the mercy ministries that are important, right? But we need more than just the mercy ministries that respond to the individual needs of people and recognize that sometimes we need justice, right, uh, for those that are most vulnerable in our societies. 
um, so that people have access and opportunity and equity um, so that everyone can flourish and thrive as God desires. Next, please. <coughs> and so I want us to think a little bit about um, our ways of engaging in that. And I really believe, so kind of tying back to where we started with Barabbas and Jesus, right, is this, uh, the means by which we go about the work that we do, right? Um, um, how does Jesus invite us into a different way of resisting evil, so to speak, uh, whether it be systemic and structural, institutional and such? Um, in, excuse me, in Luke 19, Jesus is, uh, he overlooks Jerusalem. And it says that he weeps over it if only they had known the things that make for peace, right? In this case, again, tying back to this whole theme around Barabbas and the insurrectionists, uh, there's this anticipation that, that people are not going to follow the way of Jesus and are going to engage in their own way, and it's anticipating the Roman-Jewish war in which massive violence is going to play out as they try to resist is going to come in and they're going to slaughter Jew the Jews um, by the thousands. In there were, I think, 6,000 Jews that were crucified in that war and millions more that were, I don't know, thousands more that were killed. Um, it was just horrific. The violence, um, the devastation that Rome um, poured out onto those Jews. And so there Jesus is, is inviting us. He says, if only they had known the things that make for peace, Right? Jerusalem, the city of peace, city of shalom, right? The place where God's flourishing ought to be embodied, the vocation was supposed to be lived out, and they were not living into the vocation that, that, that um, God desired. What are those things that make for peace? What kind of way of life do we live in um, is in congruity with uh, God's deliverance, God's peace, God's shalom? I believe that there are a few things that, a quick hand to take care of. There's much more than that. But a few things that at least as Christians um, should be important for us as we think about um, the work that we do in, in the broader society. It's that every person is made in the image of God. Therefore, protect the vulnerable. And we also recognize the humanity. Protect the vulnerable, but we also recognize uh, the humanity of our enemies. Uh, two, that we break cycles of violence and creatively maximize peace and justice. Um, we resist evil without becoming evil, right? Breaking the cycles of evil, overcoming evil with good, as Jesus and Paul taught. Uh, three, the call to take up our cross in the way of Jesus is a courageous, nonviolent, revolutionary response to death-dealing empire. Um, and so we do not obey Caesar. That's not where we get our marching orders from. And finally, as I said already, uh, four is the things. It's, it's literally that there are of engaging in the world that are in line with this Christ um, that are that that is the things that make for peace it is the Jesus story embodied are the things that make for peace next please so I want us to think a little bit about um, this is maybe getting into social science a little bit right um, but I know some folks they, they say to me well that's all nice Drew but you know this nonviolent stuff doesn't work anymore. It worked in the 50s and 60s, um, but nonviolence doesn't really work anymore. Now you've got to kind of match violence with violence because that's the, that's the language people understand. Um, and I think that it's a little bit naive when people say that. They don't fully understand or haven't actually looked into what they're talking about. So I want us to think through it a little bit. Um, first of all, when I say nonviolence, um, people usually hear nonviolence and then think <coughs> about going on a march or having a rally, right? And that's all that they mean when they say uh, nonviolence. And so we're kind of stuck like with what I call the one hit wonder, right? Um, and so anytime something bad happens and like, all right, let's go have a rally, let's go march. And that's the only thing that we do. Um, well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that's creative and strategic and active and sustained, right, work um, in the world. In fact, Gene Sharp, he was a scholar who in 1973, he compiled globally all the different ways that people were engaging in nonviolence, and he came up with 198 different tactics, right? 198 different tactics, uh, all sorts of creative ways that people, both under democracies 
and under dictators were engaging in nonviolence on the ground. Um, far, far from just this one hit wonder of let's just have a march or have a rally. Um, and, and what's more fascinating is that um, as people have researched, they found that um, nonviolent movements are actually twice as successful as violent ones. They're actually more successful. So despite the reputation that, they, that nonviolence has as being kind of weak and puny and not doing, it's actually being, it's more effective than the violent ones. And they say that the nonviolent uh, movements are actually increasing in effectiveness while the violent ones are actually decreasing year after year. Um, and so even just from, a, forget the theological and faith commitments, just anybody from a, just an effective standpoint would be like, oh, wait a minute, this actually is actually working better because people are actually building on knowledges globally on what's working and drawing and developing um, and growing from that. What's really fascinating also was that I learned that you didn't actually need like a whole entire society to make social change. You don't have to win everybody over necessarily. <coughs> what they found was that initially the number was 5% and now they brought it down to 3.5%. That if you have 3.5% of a population um, that's engaged, it has to be active and sustained <laughs> movement work, it's always successful. The problem is rarely is it active and sustained work, right? Um, not just a show up for a march one time, but an ongoing active and sustained movement. It's, once you hit that 3.5%, it's always successful. Very fascinating. Again, under dictators and democracies, um, they're seeing this uh, across the board. And so we're seeing the effectiveness of strategic nonviolence um, working globally all around the world. I say all that as a theologian because, just going back to the things that make for peace, right? That this is actually, it, it, we should not be surprised by this. We're, this is saying that the theological ethics of Jesus Christ work. Now, it's not a guarantee in the in a sense at any given time I can determine and guarantee the outcome of any situation. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we're in line with the cosmic Christ, right? With what God is doing in the world. Um, we should not be surprised um, that this is more effective than um, the way of Barabbas, so to speak. Next, please. Um, so I just want to really quick make a few differentiations between mass protest movements and community organizing. I'm trying to do a little basic, like, teaching, basic, right, stuff. <coughs> um, mass protest movements, basically, like, the key word, if you're going to think about them, is mobilization, right? Mobilization. How do you get people mobilized? How do you get people engaged and getting going on? And some of the strategy and what works about mass protest movements is um, it allows for kind of this broad participation. It's... Um, it kind of draws off of momentum in the broader society, like things that are happening. It's kind of, when I talk about like uh, uh, for Barabbas, that, you know, revolution was in the air, right? This thing, these moments in the air that you can kind of feel and know that um, something's happening. There's a social climate and public opinion is shifting. Um, and, and a lot of times there's this emphasis on knocking down the pillars, right? What are these kind of strategic pressure points in society that we want to bring attention to? Um, uh, mass protest movements a lot of times use disruption and confrontation and escalation as strategies for social change. Um, one of the strengths, again, is this riding of cultural momentums, that participation really is a lot easier. When there's a hundred or thousands of people, it, it's not as hard, right, to step into something where there's a mass movement going on. And so sometimes people can hide in the crowd and find a little courage that way as well. Um, so one of the weaknesses that people have identified with uh, mass protest movements is that often they have limited commitment levels and very often low structure. Um, and with those two together, protest movements can often be very short-lived. Um, and so the sustainability of them aren't usually often that long. Um, but some have argued that even when they are short-lived, doesn't necessarily mean that no change has taken place, right? Um, that, that significant change can happen, even if it's not even just the laws, even in terms of people's awareness, right, and conversations um, can shift because of, of that awareness. Next, please. Um, when we think about some recent national protest movements, 
West, we can think about the Occupy movement wasn't too long ago. Um, what's interesting about that in particular, because that one has, was often critiqued quite a bit for not having enough structure, but it is fascinating. One of the things I've been, just as an observer of it, is thinking about a lot of conversation on economics today exists precisely, were interjected from conversations that started during the Occupy movement, right? When people talk about the 99% and the 1% and all, these are common ways that people talk today. Um, and so this protest movement has shaped even rhetoric way after it is gone. Um, there's of course, uh, the Me Too movement and so much conversations around uh, sexual abuse um, and certainly how that, in terms of patriarchal societies, ways that we have to confront not only individual practices, but our institutional climates and policies in place um, that actually provide context where people can be safe, right? Um, and then, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement, which in many ways is in a second wave right, of, of undergoing and trying to unveil the racial violence that we see that has been really a part of our society for centuries, um, just in different manifestations. So we have the examples of protest movements in terms of what I'm talking about. Next, please. Um, then you have uh, community organizing. And the big word then is organization, right? So if mobilizing is about getting people mobilized and it's mass movements, or community organizing is about structure. It's about, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's about structure, it's about leadership, about commitment. Um, and usually community organizers, um, their mindset is, you know, how do we go about this work for the long haul, right? Um, and so, Usually they'll start small and they'll attack like, you know, we need a stop sign at the end of the corner. Let's start there, right? And build this kind of momentum. And this idea that, you know, sometimes um, we get afraid of the word power, but, but there's different kinds of power, right? And they say, we don't want top-down power. We want to disperse power from the people, right? Um, so what is our collective power to have a voice to speak into a society? Um, and so that's kind of a lot of the organized work is how do we slowly build and, and draw in people to take agency over their lives and their communities and to bring change that way. Um, and so it's a little bit different kind of approach than the, than the mass mobilized kind of protest movements approach, right? Um, it's about meeting with neighbors, having one-on-ones, identifying what are the needs of the community, letting people, especially those that are most vulnerable, kind of share and speak out of their own lived experience and then coming around that and working collaboratively um, to address those issues. And so you have that. Uh, one of the weaknesses, though, of community organizing is sometimes they can be a little bit inflexible around the, the methods for how you get there. So there's been critiques times that sometimes community organizers, when there's like a mass movement happening and there's energy, and some of them would be like, oh, we don't do that. And so they have all this expertise and available to them and they kind of shun the opportunity to kind of take advantage of the cultural momentum that's at hand, right? Um, that's beginning to change a little bit. You're seeing less and less of that. I think there's a little bit more openness, but, but at a time when people were like kind of like hardcore, you know, Saul Alinsky community organizers, that um, had been often uh, characteristic of many of them. Next, please. There's a lot of faith-based organizers. Um, uh, there's uh, Faith in Action is a national organization that does some stuff. There's Poor People's Campaign, which is a multi-faith movement. And then a lot of times, a lot of local manifestations. In my uh, community, we have Power Interfaith in Philly. We have um, folks, even folks that aren't officially faith-based, but kind of are. The, the MILFA does a lot of undocumented work. And, they're not officially faith-based, but it ends up being a lot of faith-based stuff anyway. And so there's really a lot of opportunities for churches to get involved in faith-based work, to partner and to bear witness to Jesus Christ in the public square, right? Um, and I think that that is actually a really easy way for churches to join in without feeling like they have to lead and take over things, but just join in and bear witness to what's going on around them. Next, please. I'm wrapping up now, and I want to just wrap up with a story. Um, so in 1963, Dr. King went to Birmingham, right? Um, and Birmingham, its nickname was Bombingham at that time because of so many unsolved bombings, bombings and, and leaders and pastors there in the city. It was not a place most people wanted to, to go to. 
it was one of the most deeply segregated cities in the South, right? And so that's why they were kind of targeted. And so uh, at one point in the movement, um, there was a bit of frustration going on among the leaders because people were not showing up the way that people wanted them to. Uh, adults were not coming out like they wanted them to. Um, they were running out of bail funds, which you don't want to go to bail. You don't want to go to Birmingham jail without any bail funds, right? Um, and there's, uh, you know, the Passover Easter weekend was like right around the corner. And most of them are like pastors themselves and have responsibilities <laughs> oftentimes in other cities, sometimes other states, right? And there they are working at this. <coughs> and so in the of all this, they all get together in Dr. King's hotel room. And you can imagine like a hotel room where like, you know, the ones that have, like, a bedroom that you have the door closed in, like a living room space, right? And they're all there. It's a bunch of civil rights leaders. And they're all debating what they should do next because the city had just put an injunction against them, um, against marching, and they're just not sure what to do. And so everyone's debating, and everyone's got a perspective. Some people are saying, you know, we've got to just go against this injunction, and we're going to we'll go to jail, and it doesn't matter. We've just got to do what we've got to do. Others are saying, wait, wait, why don't we send Dr. King out and he can go fundraise, right? He, nobody can raise funds like him. Let's put this on pause. He can go fundraise. Then we can rejoin the thing afterwards, right? Others were saying, like, actually, D Daddy King was there, right? Dr. King's, and he was like, you need to come home to Atlanta, you know? And others are saying, look, I got to be, I, Easter's the most important, you know, day of the Christian year, like, I've got to be in the pulpit. I have responsibilities to my church. And so everyone is debating and arguing what they should do next. And the whole time that people are arguing and debating, Dr. King hasn't said anything at all. He's just sitting there quietly. He's just listening as people are putting in their input about what they need to do. And suddenly, Dr. King gets up, and he leaves the room and goes into the bedroom and closes the door. Minutes go by. People are kind of puzzled. I don't know what's going on. And then finally, after a while, the door opens up again and now comes Dr. King. But something's a little different about Dr. King now, right? Usually, you see pictures of Dr. King. He's usually kind of in like a black suit, kind of clean cut look, black tie, kind of classic kind of clean look, right? Dr. King now has changed his clothes. Now he's wearing blue jeans and a blue work shirt. The moment he comes out, everybody knows exactly what that means. Dr. King has just signified it's time to roll up our sleeves and get to work. We're not going to go celebrating the Easter story through a fancy service, we're going to embody the meaning of Passover and Easter. Embody the meaning of Jesus' life and teachings. And accept the consequences that come with that. And so that's what he does, right? If there's the famous picture with Dr. King and Ralph Abernathy and Fred Shuttlesworth all there, each of them with blue jeans and a blue work shirt now, there as they go out and they get arrested and that's where Dr. King gets thrown into the Birmingham jail. In fact, if you, you're a historian of any sort, you know he writes the famous letter from Birmingham jail from that moment as well. I think that provides us a, a good challenge maybe to leave with for tonight, which is <coughs> maybe Dr. King is also asking us who will be a witness and is inviting us to respond by saying, let's put on our blue jeans. Let's put on our blue jeans for justice. Let's put on our blue jeans for righteousness, right? For, let's put on our blue jeans so justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like overflowing streams. Let's put on our blue jeans because there's disproportionate suffering in our world today. And our neighbors are depending on the church to show up and be faithful. Let's put on our blue jeans, right? Because 
uh, there are malnourished children in our world, and there are uh, uh, public education systems that are underfunded, and there are neighborhoods that have been crippled from decades of redlining and targeting and discrimination, right? There are people who don't have access to livable wages and jobs and health care. Let's put on our blue jeans, right, in the way of Jesus and actually embody the Jesus story, the good news of Jesus Christ for our neighbors, um, seeking to, to participate in God's reign, to participate in God's deliverance in the world. Um, joining in with what God is doing in the world. Uh, so my challenge for us tonight is let's put on our blue jeans. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Drew, for calling us to action. We're thinking, and we need to get moving. Thank you. We have time for a, a couple of questions and comments. So uh, Eric has the microphone. Just signal to him if you'd like to uh, respond in any way to what we've heard this evening. My wife and I had some thoughts after this morning's presentation. May we share those with you? Sure, absolutely. Uh, we don't have as much a question as we have an affirmation. For two years, 1967 to 69, we lived in Boone, North Carolina. There are seven small African-American churches there. And what we want to do is testify for, to the profound impact they had on us those two years. First, because they invited us to live in their community on Junaluska Road, up in the mountain. They took us into their homes. They fed us incredible food. They took us into their community. We'd walk up Junaluska on a Sunday afternoon and visit with folks as they're sitting in their front porch. I was in grad school, and together we were caring for the youth of the church. In grad school, I was taking courses on racism and replicating the Clark study you mentioned this morning. But in church, and Saturday afternoons, we were with the young people and we watched over time how they were toxified by a racist culture. We were moved by their care for us, their love for us. More than once, Ann and I were threatened and they came and said, we've got your back, you're gonna be okay. We were nourished by the incredible service, worship services on a Sunday morning, foot stomping spirituality, vibrant, filled with hope in spite of suffering. And what I also witnessed, what we witnessed, is their commitment to peace. In the 1960s, there were busloads of demonstrators coming from the north. And Reverend Rondo, the district minister, met them at the bus stop, at the bus station, he says. And as they're coming off, he says, whoa, just stay there, my friends. Just keep right on moving. We're going to solve this problem on our own without any violence. 
And that is what happened. Those two years profoundly shaped my life. And I'm grateful for how they, as a part of the larger black culture, can change people. I'm grateful, deeply grateful. Um, in that letter from the Birmingham jail, um, Dr. King had a pretty strong message to the white moderate. Um, and so my question is, and I think, I think he was asking that question, who will be a witness to, to them as well. And so my question is, is what does that message look like um, in today's context? And what, what happens when the white moderate responds to that call? Dr. Hart, thank you very much for uh, both this afternoon and tonight. I uh, want to thank you for your voice and your witness and also the gift your family uh, has given in terms of releasing you to us for these couple of days. So thank you for that. Um, I want to ask a question that is probably difficult to frame. I don't want to suggest for a moment that there's only one way to construct a black theology or a black voice uh, in terms of 
the way in which our faith is framed. But one of the challenges that I've faced in personal relationships, in conversations, uh, whether over social media or in person, is with people who represent uh, sort of the whiteness and white tradition of the Protestant or evangelical church in our context, and will gravitate to what I perceive to be, and I could be wrong, but I perceive to be outlier voices of black people who would sort of carry forward some of the same critiques of this is Marxist ideology that you're, you're giving us, this is revisionist history, these types of things. And so I wonder if you could give us a sense of how you personally or perhaps within the wider context of the conversations and networks that you're part of, how do you process, I'm not going to name names, we, I could think of political commentators, a recent political candidate who ran for governor here in the state, uh, reformed pastors, but there's some of these outlier voices and many of my white friends will say, well, see, that black person agrees with my understanding of history and, and the way I construct theology. So just wanted to know if you got some response. range 
of perspectives and that the community's wisdom would come forth, right? I think that that's much more powerful because then it, 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 it guards against that temptation of seeking out the token voice um, and lifting up that one perspective um, to put up against others, which is usually what happens when white people are too afraid to say racist things themselves. They look for a black face to say it for them. So thank you again for your presence with us tonight. Uh, thank you for those who've tuned in. And tomorrow morning, 7.30, breakfast right here, and then 10 o'clock college hour in this place. Would you bow with me for prayer? Our God, uh, thank you for Drew's contribution to our life. And we ask that you will uh, guard and guide his family, his wife and sons as they await his return also his students, and give him energy as he returns to, to that life of uh, leadership. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.